Hello, everybody. This is Kerry Lavelle, and thanks for uh, patching in and joining us in the webinar. Uh, the topic today is small business governance, and uh, it's really about the devil being in the details in small business governance. Uh, we've talked about this a lot in the past with attorneys and accountants, and you kind of need to understand that uh, relationships are formed when businesses start up. Uh, there are relationships between the shareholders vis-a-vis -vis each other. There's relationship uh, between the, the corporation and the shareholders, the directors and the shareholders. And as we sort of move on and sort of learn more about the, uh, the relationships that are established, we'll talk about the, the uh, implied under the law uh, re uh, relationships plus what's in the documents. So the devil is in the details, and it's in the documentation, and that's what you kind of need to understand as we sort of go forward. Again, I'm Kerry Laval. I really appreciate you tuning in, and the host of people that are joining us today include uh, lawyers, accountants, and uh, investment bankers, and I, I welcome you all. These are all issues that are kind of really critical as you advise and counsel your clients, which are the business owners that are all our clients, as to uh, the responsibilities they have among each other. So we'll press forward and always remember the, the corporate hierarchy. And this is a starting point. And really, after practicing law for 27 or 28 years, I still to this day go to this hierarchy to remind myself, as disputes arise between the various constituent groups of the corporation, who's in charge of who? And then I always have to look at the documentation. So never forget the fact that the shareholders own the company. The shareholders have the ability to create all the corporate documentation and set forth the standards and documents that we'll go through today. The shareholders appoint a board of directors. The board of directors then create a uh, set of policies for the growth of the company and the plan of the company and they vest the officers of the corporation to execute on that plan. Okay, so the shareholders appoint the directors and the directors appoint the officers. Now, keep that in mind whether or not it's a Fortune 100 company or a medium-sized business working in your community. The shareholders own it, and if you own shares in Apple stock or Joe's Lawn Care, you're the shareholder, you're the owner. Now, Joe's Lawn Care may or may not need a board of directors, but in some cases, when there are outside constituent owners, they may require a board of directors. And again, the officers in the outside world are those people that have the authority to be able to sign documentation on behalf of the corporation. The officers are generally the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. In some entities, they give them other names, like a general manager in the manufacturing business, for example. But the officers, if they're vested with the title and the rights set forth in the state's corporation act, they have the authority to bind the company. And remember, the officer's duty is to carry out the charge set forth by the board of directors. And that's how you sort of go forward as you uh, move forward in the corporation. So. Uh, we're going to go into great detail today in this uh, webinar on the basic documentation, but also the rights that are embedded in the law that sets up the relationship between those parties, shareholders, directors, and officers, and the corporation itself. So where does it all start? It starts with the filing of a documentation, documentation called the Articles of Incorporation. Depending on what jurisdiction you're in, the Articles of Incorporation are kind of a form uh, developed by the Secretary of State in your state. But as attorneys, we can modify that form any way we want, okay? It has to comply with the, or, uh, the Business Corporation Act in your jurisdiction, but you don't have to use the form. You can do it any way you want. So the Articles of Incorporation uh, sets forth the shareholder rights uh, among themselves and what rights each share has that the uh, shareholders own. For example, there could be preferred shares, there could be common shares, there could be shares that get a dividend, there could be shares that have voting rights, there could be shares that have no voting rights, and uh, various kind of rights. That would be embedded in the Articles of Incorporation. That's a document that sets up the share, uh, share rights. The second are the bylaws. Generally, they're established by the shareholders, but not necessarily. In Illinois, we certainly do it that way, and I'm, I want to kind of 
put a footnote on that. Uh, it is best if the shareholders create the bylaws because remember the shareholders own the company and they start to set up the rules that everyone has to operate under. So the bylaws will have the language that has the necessary requirements for shareholder meetings. What's a quorum? How many shareholders have to be available to have a quorum? Could you have proxies? Is there an annual meeting? If there is special meetings, how much notice do you have to give the shareholders? Five days or 15 days? Could they be, um, they have to be present? Could they call in for shareholder meetings? This is true. I mean, there, there have been small businesses that have uh, established shareholder meetings out on a boat in Lake Michigan just to avoid certain shareholders attending. Now, the, the, the Articles of Incorporation and the bylaws should speak to those kind of things to make sure somebody can't thwart the spirit of the bylaws by setting up some sort of ridiculous uh, meeting like that. Um, the next d document, and uh, as you will see, to really resolve a lot of these disputes, the best thing to do, as we call it the corporate prenuptial agreement, is to sit down with your partners in a small business setting and set forth the rights of the shareholders among themselves in a shareholder agreement. It is the best way to have the hard conversations with people up front and to make sure that you go through all the corporate governance things between the shareholders and everybody understands their rights with respect to um, each other and then ultimately with respect to the company. Um, we're frozen a little bit here. Um, the Articles of Incorporation with a little bit more detail will uh, provide for certain uh, shareholder rights it will set forth the classes of stock, as I indicated, distribution rights, dividend rights, liquidation rights, uh, voting needed for a substantial change in the business. So uh, we would want in the Articles of Incorporation, if the corporation was to take uh, steps towards what we call inorganic changes of the business, so it's something other than operating in the ordinary uh, course of business, we'd want the shareholders to be approved that. We would not want the directors to be able to make a decision that, well, we're a high-tech company today, but now we're going to go start making cars tomorrow. That would be outside the ordinary course of business. Or we're going to sell off all our assets. That's certainly a change outside the ordinary course of business, and we'd want the shareholders to approve that. Also, in the Articles of Incorporation, there are simple things like the corporate purpose and the registered agent that you have to fill in and make sure that is uh, completed properly. Uh, the bylaws uh, also uh, under the shareholder section will talk about what a quorum uh, will be in terms of getting uh, things passed by the shareholders, um, voting trust and proxies. And of course, uh, under the jurisdiction, I'm sure in which you live, but certainly in Illinois, uh, shareholders have a right to inspect the records uh, as long as it's for a proper purpose. So a minority shareholder who owns just one share stock has a right for a proper purpose to look at the corporate minute books, the tax returns, the uh, accounting, uh, the gap accounting uh, records, all the documentation if you're a shareholder. It's set forth just that way in the, um, uh, in the Business Corporation Act. So, yes, everybody really hates conflict, and that's the reason as an uh, advisor, it is important and incumbent upon us as advisors to business owners is to have the tough conversations early with, the, uh, with fellow shareholders and directors. Get the governance right. Get the documentation right, because an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, I think I've uh, heard before. So it's really necessary to be able to get um, your conflict talked through early on when people are level-headed and uh, there's no threats of lawsuit. You get that done early on and everybody sort of moves on in a more professional manner. The bylaws also speak to some director rights. Now remember I told you that the bylaws should be enacted by the shareholders, so the shareholders are going to set forth some rules with respect to directors. The board of directors manage the business and affairs of the corporation. The authority of the directors is limited by the articles and or bylaws. And the shareholders are going to say, hey, directors, if it's a, if it's a, a moderate-sized company and a directors, we have 13 or 15 directors, uh, the shareholders will say, well, let's set up committees 
for the directors, an executive committee, for example, of five directors, so everyone doesn't have to come together as a board to make some um, uh, ongoing decisions. There should be an audit committee, a governance committee, a uh, compensation committee, and of course the directors are charged with the duty of hiring officers. And I should say, uh, kind of footnote that, that the directors are also in charge of the duty of firing officers too. So they have a very important uh, role. And when I say officers, again, we're talking president, vice president. Um, sometimes you heard of um, the CEO, CFO, um, uh, COO. <coughs> Those are the C-suite uh, titles. They're more popular now than uh, the, the, the statute requires. But uh, it's the directors who hire all the C-suite uh, officers of the corporation. So going back, whenever you start to sort of get a little confused with the re relationships between um, all those folks, just remember the hierarchy, because I do it too. It's the shareholders, they set forth who the directors are, and the directors set forth who the officers are. Shareholders set the rules for the directors, and the directors set up the rules for the officers. So, after you get through the basic documents, you have the uh, uh, fiduciary duties of the directors. So, the directors have a fiduciary duty to the corporation and all of its shareholders. And I'll repeat that kind of for the sake of the emphasis. The directors have a fiduciary duty to the entity itself and all of its shareholders. So all of its shareholders is very difficult because each shareholder of the company may have a different end goal with respect to the company. If it's a building company that builds buildings, for example, one of the shareholders may have an interest in a concrete company. It may have an interest in some other uh, business that he or she has disclosed in the past. Well, that particular shareholder or a couple of those shareholders may have a different constituent interest than the corporation itself and or its other shareholders. So the d directors have to consider the corporation and all of its shareholders, not one constituent group. Also, the shareholders may also be common shareholders, preferred shareholders, dividend uh, receiving shareholders, non-dividend, voting, non-voting. The Illinois law is very clear, just like it is in many jurisdictions, that the fiduciary duty extends to all of its shareholders. All right, not to beat a dead horse, let's move on with the exact fiduciary duties. Number one, you have a duty of loyalty. So the best advice I can give to all the advisors on the phone is that the duty of loyalty is satisfied by putting the company first, putting the company first. So the notes say that you cannot profit from the company's opportunities individually as a director because you have to put the company first. So if you want to do a deal that is in the company's uh, ordinary course of business and you want to usurp that uh, opportunity for yourself, there's a procedure for that, and you have to make a full disclosure and ask the board to vote on it. Uh, the duty of loyalty means the duty of fairness and uh, the place of burden of proof on the fiduciary. So if something goes wrong and you are in court because you breached your fiduciary duty, the burden shifts to you as the director to try to prove your case. Number two, the second uh, duty the directors have is the duty of care. This is a duty that says you must act with appropriate diligence, and you have to act as a uh, reasonable person would act in a same situation. Do not act recklessly. The takeaway on this is you must ask all the hard questions. We're going to get into that in a little bit, but you need to ask the questions that are required of you to take uh, to meet your duty of care. So you need to look at financial statements. You need to analyze the market. You need to do the things that you need to do to make sure that you send the um, officers on the way with the appropriate um, direction. The third one is a duty of confidentiality. The duty of confidentiality is just simple that everything that's said in the boardroom stays in the boardroom. And you cannot uh, use that information for your own good. If you want to enter into a transaction with a company or with a company opportunity, the first place to start is full disclosure to the board. So everything that you find out in the boardroom has to stay in the uh, boardroom. 
There are other fiduciary duties too that are not articulated in most of the statutes. They are directed, uh, they uh, come about over years and years of uh, case law and uh, those duties uh, include the duty of disclosure. If you know something that has relevancy for the corporation, you need to disclose it. And um, of course, the duty not to misappropriate assets. That's, that's a lesser standard than stealing, but it should be looked at in those, in those terms. So if you have any control over assets or you're voting on assets, you cannot misappropriate them to your personal benefit when you're sitting in the role of a director in a corporation. So let's say you meet all those uh, responsibilities. Let's say you do that. So then you have to make a decision and vote on a, uh, a matter that's outside the business uh, uh, ordinary course of business. You have to get all the information necessary because that's your duty of care. And if you do all those things and vote and you make a business decision on an informed basis, in good faith, and with the honest belief that the course taken was in the best interest of the corporation, then you will be protected by the business judgment rule. It doesn't act as an absolute defense, but it is a very good defense in the case of being sued for a particular step that you've taken. Now remember, just to, re just to remind you, it has to be taken on an informed basis, in good faith, with an honest belief that the course taken was in the best interest of the corporation. It can be rebutted by evidence that the director act, acted fraudulently or illegally, but we're really talking about the business judgment rule where the uh, director is acting in good faith. So if the director acts in good faith and, and does what's best for the company, there is not a rule that it has to work out perfectly. In other words, the director could vote in favor of buying a new line of business for the company or opening uh, a new outlet in another state and it completely could be a failure. It could be a failure. It could cost the corporation millions of dollars. But if the director acted on an informed basis, in good faith, and with an honest belief that the course taken was in the best interest of the company at the time the vote was taken, he will be protected by the business judgment rule, and that will act as a defense in court against his uh, conduct. So... With respect to a director's review, this is pretty important. And more and more jurisdictions are adopting this standard. And in Illinois, it's under the uh, Business Corporation Act in 8.85, that an officer, directors, may, in consideration of the long-term interest of the company, consider the effects of any action, are you ready yet for this, that the corporation has upon the employees suppliers and customers of the corporation or its subsidiaries, communities in which offices and other establishments of the corporation or its subsidiaries are located or other pertinent factors. That's huge because in the 1980s, uh, a director had one goal, and that was to maximize shareholder wealth, maximize shareholder wealth. Well, here in Illinois, you see exactly that the director can take a broader view of the decisions he or she is making for the betterment of the corporation and can consider the effect upon employees, suppliers, customers, or its subsidiaries, or the communities in which its offices or other establishments of the business are located in. Uh, that's, that's a huge departure from the old rule of just maximizing shareholder value. So, when uh, the director gets sued improperly under uh, breach of fiduciary duties, and his, one of his defenses are that uh, he's the business judgment rule, he will also look to Section 8.85 and say, under his analysis, he was taking a vote for all these things that were in the betterment of these other constituent groups associated with the corporation that were not the corporation or shareholders. To be effective, a director should become familiar with the corporation's businesses, including the economic and competitive environment. But you've got to look at a lot of things. The director should look at the principal uh, operational, financial, and other plans, strategies, and objectives of the company, uh, where it lies in its significant business segment, uh, segments for recent periods and its uh, competitors. The director can also consider things like, uh, must ask, 
uh, what are the objectives and strategic plans of the company going forward, the degree of the achievement of the uh, board approved objectives, financial statements, appropriate segment, divisional breakdowns, systems and control to promote compliance with laws or corporate policies, and material litigation and regulatory matters. That's just a list between these two slides of director's conduct and what you need to ask to become an informed director to be able to use the business judgment rule as a defense to lawsuits. Um, so whether or not the directors assert themselves during board meetings and set up these strategic plans, they need to ask those questions and they need to feel comfortable that there are uh, people there that are ready to accept and execute on their strategic plans. And I think it's very critical. And um, uh, again, as advisors, what you need to remind directors, it is incumbent upon them to be getting out there and asking uh, questions and asking all the hard questions that we just uh, talked about. Directors will be liable for anything distributed in violation of their your local statutes the, if the corporation is insolvent or if there's cash less uh, than any liabilities uh, owed to uh, liabilities liability shareholders with preference and liquidation. So be careful um, if and when the corporation gets in what we call the zone of insolvency, the zone of insolvency, it's really when a heightened uh, degree of responsibility uh, or your advice to your director clients should be uh, raised. So if the, there are distributions of assets of the corporation outside of the corporation to shareholders, to other stakeholders of the corporation, that will become a red flag and it will become a problem if the corporation really is in is insolvent or in the zone of uh, insolvency, which is being close to insolvent. Because remember, insolvent by definition is just when the liabilities of the corporation exceed the asset value of the corporation. So nobody ever has that nailed down path because the value of the assets is very fluid and some of those value of assets might be uh, valued recently as a going concern and then the business starts to go down and those assets are worth less when they're being uh, used by a corporation that is uh, losing uh, value. So. Again, with respect to the director's liability, your advice to your director clients is be careful as you get into the zone of uh, insolvency. Uh, directors will not be liable if she or, he or she relied on financial statements in good faith on her decisions. Uh, bottom line is make sure uh, the full analysis of financial statements get put into the minutes and in resolutions so the directors can be uh, prepared and have a defense going forward on these kind of matters. So your director, you're giving advice to the company and you need to say, hey, why would I do this and uh, be part of an organization where you're a very small piece sitting in a director chair when there are officers um, executing on our plan, you are not involved in the day to day, you are not in the warehouse, you are not in the plant. How, why do I do this? Well, one of the things you do do it for is to move a corporation to, to the next level, but the protections that you're looking for would be indemnity and insurance. So check the bylaws to make sure that the corporation can't come back and sue the director. Now, that's a traditional indemnity clause, uh, or that if the director gets sued, that this corporation will stand behind or indemnify the director for any loss, including the cost of defense. Uh, in any director meeting, you should make sure and ask the question of whether or not there is director and officer insurance to protect uh, the actions of the directors who are acting in good faith. Now, I've given you a whole kind of uh, arsenal of reasons uh, and ways to stand assured, stay assured they will not have the liability going forward if you do things right. Now, don't take that to mean you won't get sued. The director can get sued, and he may get sued. So the cost of defense could be a large economic loss on its own. So in order to do that, please make sure you are insured with directors and officer uh, liability. Um, I think it's kind of very important you need to do that. And 
make sure it's in the minutes and make sure the officers uh, go out and get the uh, director insurance bid and get it paid for. Uh, the Articles of Incorporation can limit the personal liability directors, but, but cannot limit certain liabilities, like the fiduciary things that we talked about earlier, due to your loyalty, knowing violations of the law, and improper personal benefit of a director. So even if there is a limitation on the personal liability of directors, if the director acts in bad uh, faith, um, he's still going to be uh, uh, liable. Uh, just as we're kind of pressing along here, please remember everybody who's on um, listening that there should be a box on uh, your uh, screen to be able to write in for any questions or anything like that or type in questions and get them out to me. Um, click the raise your hand icon and if you do that I think you're going to get queued up and you can type in a question. So feel free to do that at any time. And, if I recall, if I remember, I will kind of remind you throughout our uh, presentation today. So um, let's press on. Get insured. Uh, shareholders also have a fiduciary duty. So we've been talking about uh, director fiduciary duty all along, but now the shareholders have a fiduciary duty. Uh, they have it to the corporation, and of course they have it uh, to uh, other shareholders. Illinois has not adopted the Revlon standard, which is the standard that says you must get maximum value. In fact, as I find out, more and more uh, states have rejected the Revlon standard. The only thing that's required in many states is the fair value requirement, fair value, not maximum value. So do you remember earlier in the presentation I said that various shareholders may have different constituent interests in the corporation? Um, let's just say there are <laughs> uh, dividend-paying stocks and non-dividend-paying stocks. So each party, depending on what shares you own, may have a different requirement as to what they think the future of the company should be and the direction they should go. That is uh, really polarizing the shareholders, but it happens. It really does happen. As a director and as a shareholder, the only thing you need to do, uh, or as a shareholder, voting for a business uh, combination is that the company must get fair value for its shareholders. Regarding dissenting shareholder rights, only fair value is required. So dissenting shareholders are the people who would vote against a merger or a consolidation or a sale. They would vote against that. But as long as they're getting fair value, the courts will protect the vote of the shareholder and not say they breach their fiduciary duty. You do not need to get in, in, in jurisdictions that has the, have the fair value standard, you don't need to get maximum value. So those dissenting shareholders come about in mergers, consolidation, stock sales. Uh, dissension can demand more information and be careful on objecting in a timely fashion and seeking uh, fair value. So there is a certain set of rules out there for dissenting shareholders. And you just, if you're going to be a dissenting shareholder, you need to make sure you do it in the right way. Um, so timing is everything, and it needs to be done properly. What is fair value? Well, it's the value of the shares immediately before the consummation of the corporate action, which the center objects. Trust me, there's, um, there's a, a lot written about what is fair value, and fortunately or unfortunately, it comes down to valuation principles in a court of law. <clears throat> the best thing I can tell you to do as, a, as an advisor is to... Um, before that happens, get an outside firm, the investment bankers are great for this, to prepare an opinion of fairness. Uh, fairness opinions matter a lot. And if a outside party cannot validate the fairness of the deal, you probably would not win in court. But if you can validate the fairness of the deal, then it should be um, kind of go forward on that basis. We got a question that came in approximately how many other states other than Illinois have adopted requirement for directors to consider matters other than shareholder value. I'm not sure if I have a total uh, tally of that. We're in the Midwest, we're in the uh, uh, Illinois, and most of the Midwest uh, states have that. And we've seen that, and of course uh, Delaware does. So not sure, I don't have a total consensus on it, but it's a great question and probably a good uh, topic for an article too, by the way. Um, Please keep the questions coming. 
So when you have business combinations with interested shareholders, um, please remember to make full disclosure needed. Uh, the, uh, a real good standard is that you're an interested shareholder if you own at least 15% of the voting shares of the company, but please don't really, really use that as the only safe harbor. As an advisor to shareholders, if they are a 1% interest uh, holder in the company, make the full disclosure. Make the full disclosure to all the shareholders and the directors and get on record with your being an interested shareholder, but just get it out there. So that, that safe harbor is there, but um, we know better than that. Just kind of continue to go forward and see if there's a way that um, uh, you can get your information out there. So don't, uh, don't hide behind the safe harbor. Uh, error on the side of full disclosure. And business combinations could be almost anything. It could be a sale of assets. It could be a, certainly a merger. It could be a, uh, a purchase or a corporate opportunity. So if you see that, please make full disclosure. Um, and, you know, in the course of these kind of things, you're always uh, kind of making disclosures of what opportunities are good for the corporation, and uh, it just kind of needs to go uh, in a way of uh, being open and honest with the corporation. Remember the very first thing we talked about with respect to directors is you have a duty of uh, care, and you need to put the company first. Now, that can be abrogated by language in a shareholder agreement, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with LLCs in a little bit, um, uh, that you may be able to compete against the company if you have prearranged approval to do that. <clears throat> uh, duties to other shareholders. This is a, uh, a kind of a very important topic that, that individuals who control a corporation owe a fiduciary duty uh, to their corporation and its shareholders. Duty of good faith and fair dealing is the minority shareholders. So uh, to any of you who have been thinking that the things I've been talking about with directors only apply to bigger businesses, this next section on duties to other shareholders apply to all the small businesses that we do a lot of work with collectively. Okay? So if you own 75% uh, of the company and another shareholder holds 25% of the company, it would not be um, outside of, uh, you, you know, kind of the reasonableness of your thinking to say, well, the 75% shareholder should make all the calls and make all the decisions because he owns 75% of the company, right? Isn't that the 51% standard? You own 51% standard and you can do whatever you want to do. Um, not true. Not true. Under many jurisdictions, particularly in Illinois, there is a duty not to oppress other minority shareholders. So the 800-pound gorilla just cannot control the company as though it's his own uh, bank account and conduct himself as such. So when does the level of uh, shareholder duty rise to the level of uh, oppression? So. If you imagine somebody kind of controlling the checkbook and the assets of the company in a way to solely benefit themselves at the expense of another minority shareholder, you're probably on to something. You're probably on to something. There's certainly a breach of good faith and fair dealing. Um, whether a reasonable expectation of minority share, shareholder has been frustrated by the actions of the majority a lack of probity or fair dealing in the affairs of the company or some sort of deprivation by a majority shareholder of participation in a minority shareholder. It's sort of all kind of uh, uh, fluffy, kind of vague um, terms. But there are cases out there that categorize this kind of conduct as just a classic, classic minority shareholder freeze out. So a common freeze out technique includes the termination of the minority shareholder's employment, the refusal to declare dividends, the removal of the minority shareholder from a position of management, or siphoning off the corporate earnings through high compensation to the majority shareholders. Um, imagine. So the majority shareholder wants to get rid of the minority shareholder. What's the first thing he can do? Just fire him. Just fire him. And then say, oh, by the way, I hope you enjoy your 25% interest in the company. We're not issuing any dividends anymore. Ah, there's no profit left because I just took my salary from $100,000 a year to $500,000 a year. No, so there's no profits. There's no uh, dividends to declare. 
So if they do that, uh, the majority shareholder or shareholders in combination together acting to freeze out a minority shareholder, there are consequences. Um, oh, there are other I ideas here that we see regularly, um, siphoning off corporate earnings via leases and loans favorable to the shareholder. Uh, shareholder makes a loan uh, to the company and then gets paid back at 20% interest, uh, misappropriation of assets. Uh, usurping corporate opportunities. So in other words, the majority shareholder started the company and he has all the customers and uh, he wants to freeze out the minority shareholder. So now he sets up another corporation and starts taking all the customers and moving them over to his own corporation that he owns 100% of. Again, freeze out technique. So um, yes, the minority shareholder will look like you're always looking down the back and behind the majority shareholder. That's because he, the, the majority shareholder has legal rights. Now, it doesn't mean the minority shareholder has the right to control the corporation, but you cannot freeze out the minority shareholder uh, at the, the minority shareholder's expense just to benefit the majority shareholder. Remember what the rule was from earlier in the presentation, the company comes first. So what's the remedy for this kind of conduct? There's basically 12 uh, options that uh, are listed in various uh, Business Corporations Act, and uh, but there's you know maybe six or eight that are typically sought after in the court. One is just dissolve the corporation, just dissolution, get rid of it. Or if you're the minority shareholder, you say, hey, buy me out. Or I want payment of dividends. You have to uh, realign the salaries and the lease payments of the company, um, and then if there's profit left, pay me my dividend amount. If I have economic damages, maybe I have damages too. Because what if I was wrongfully terminated as just part of the freeze out? Now I'm an unemployed shareholder that don't, doesn't get any dividends or any benefits out of the company. Um, you can ask the court to appoint interim directors, officers, and you can ask the court to remove the directors and officers. And you can ask for a temporary restraining order to make uh, certain adjustments on the corporation um, while things get straightened out. Uh, another topic I wanted to raise is uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. It's um, Time's going by fast and it's over 15 years old and it was a uh, financial mandate that was uh, enacted in Congress as a response to Enron, Tyco, and WorldCom. And for those of you too young to remember, those corporations uh, acted with uh, bad financial accounting and uh, financial disclosures and being publicly held corporations, we found out all too late that there was uh, an enormous amount of uh, debt and uh, a lack of integrity in the financial reporting of those corporations. They went under, shareholders lost money, retirees lost money, they filed bankruptcy, uh, pensions were uh, cleaned out, zeroed out, and uh, it went to a great deal of harm to a lot of people. So as a response, uh, Congress enacted Sarbanes-Oxley. Generally speaking, these, uh, this uh, act uh, really applies to publicly held companies. There's a few sections that apply to non-public companies, like retaliation taken against whistleblowers cannot be tolerated and willful destruction of evidence. There's a few sections that are adopted, uh, were intended only for publicly held companies, but may, many, many, many corporations that are smaller than public held companies adopted these rules as just a matter of good corporate governance and good financial uh, uh, reporting. For example, the CEO and CFO must certify financial statements. Liability insurers are required a quorum uh, compliance. They want to get a majority of people on board. They avoid conflicts of interest. They avoid loans to executives. And they do want audit committees set forth in the bylaws of the company so that they uh, sort of kind of keep an eye on those sorts of things. The directors under Sarbanes-Oxley uh, should demand audit independence, analysis of conflicts of interest, corporate and criminal fraud accountability, and white collar crime penalty enhancement. CEOs should sign the tax returns. Um, again, it rises, uh, it raises the level of responsibility for a CEO and the C-suite employees and uh, it is very, very reasonable for us as advisors 
<coughs> excuse me, to require of our clients to, to adopt many of the Sarbanes-Oxley requirements. So uh, what do we do to fix it? We need a process. We need as good a process as we can possibly come up with. And the best way to do it is just get in front of it. Just get in front of it and have all the tough decisions up front. So whether or not you're marrying up uh, shareholders in a merger, if you're marrying up uh, shareholders in the beginning of a new business enterprise, uh, we highly recommend shareholder agreements. So in the old days, uh, small businesses used to have these agreements called buy-sell agreements. Uh, buy-sell agreement just really addresses a couple of bad situations, one person buying out another in the event of death, disability, or a, a divorce, or some sort of a, uh, incapacity. Shareholder agreements uh, include that, the buy-sell provisions, but include a lot more, okay? So they do include the buy-sell provisions that we're kind of talking about. Um, they can include put-call provisions or options to sell or purchase. So if I, I want a, a put right on my shares, that means that if I'm a minority shareholder, <coughs> I just can put my shares to the corporation. The corporation must buy me out. Uh, not common, but you need to know it exists. A call provision is generally a, a provision exercised by the majority shareholder to say, hey, minority shareholder, you're not pu pulling your weight. I don't want to oppress you and freeze you out. I'm just going to buy you out. And then there's a formula in place, and then you can buy out the, uh, the, the uh, minority shareholder. That's the put call provisions. Income and distribution should be talked about in a shareholder agreement. So when you make $100,000, is it going to be distributed? Certainly the portion that should be distributed is what your tax liability might be if you're a flow-through entity like an S-corporation or an LLC. If it's a C-corporation, maybe there, are, there will be no distributions. Maybe you need a certain vote to approve a dividend from the corporation. That needs to be talked about up front. Management and control. So there are certain things that the management of the corporation would, would require a 51% vote on, and that is just to kind of keep things moving with the corporation. There are certain other higher threshold issues that may require a supermajority vote of the corporation, uh, shareholders, I mean. So is your supermajority uh, defined by 66%, 70%, 75%? 60%, it could be whatever you want. There's no hard and fast rule on what a supermajority uh, should be, but under management and control, you have to determine that, and you got to talk about all those things up front. So in ongoing businesses, it's just you know, ongoing what the officers do for the corporation to continue to stay within their organic state of uh, buying and selling their services. And um, inorganic matters may require a higher level, like, uh, new office leases, leasing more property, purchasing a new site, uh, a new plant. That may require a supermajority. Uh, transfers to third party or classes of buyers and permitted transferees. Certainly if I'm a shareholder of a corporation, I shouldn't have to go back and get shareholder approval if I want to transfer my shares to a revocable trust for my benefit and my children's benefit it, or my spouse's benefit. It's more of an estate planning maneuver so long as I keep the voting interest. But if I want to sell my shares to my neighbor, I think my fellow shareholders would, would have a, should have a say in that. They should say, hey, no, no, Kerry, I don't want you to sell them. I want to be your partner. I don't want to be your neighbor's partner. In fact, I don't even know your neighbor. So that's reasons why there are generally um, uh, limitations on the transfers of shares in small corporations. Maybe there should be some triggering events for mandatory buyouts or optional buyouts, such as death, disability, bankruptcy, divorce. Um, you know, again, you went into business with your partner, not your partner's spouse. So if your partner's spouse has a legal right to get some of the shares in a divorce, you may want to have a uh, ability to buy out those shares and just give your partner cash, take back the stock, and that doesn't affect his uh, family balance sheet because you're exchanging stock for cash, but it takes that, uh, that risk off the table of having partners that you never uh, bargained for. Build an evaluation formula, uh, funding and purchase price. Sometimes we put tag-along rights and drag-along rights in shareholder agreements. A tag-along right would be a right for a minority shareholder 
in the very, very, very unlikely event that a majority shareholder can sell his or her 75% to a buyer and leave the 25% minority shareholder uh, person in place, that shareholder is going to want a, um, a tag-along right to be able to sell into the bigger uh, transaction. A drag-along right is the same thing. If a uh, majority shareholder wants to sell the business and he's got a 10% shareholder, he's not going to go along with it, and he needs based on the shareholder agreement that somebody prepared 20 years ago, a unanimous consent of shareholders to sell, that shareholder, minority, uh, majority shareholder is going to want drag along rights to be able to drag along the minority shareholder into a sale. Uh, you got to also consider bank covenants all the time. You can't do anything in the shareholder agreement that would breach your bank covenants. And then there's a the miscellaneous and how to amend the shareholder agreement. Um, also remember, if you got a 50-50 split on shareholders, figure out a way to get through deadlock. Um, I personally still like to put a duty of loyalty uh, section in there, although there's a fiduciary case law duty of loyalty. I still like to put them in there and the covenant not to compete. Let's uh, get up front if we are going to be able to compete with the company and generally the answer is no. We're going to see a little bit of a difference in uh, the LLC area. So, uh, while about uh, three quarters of our presentation was on corporations, uh, much of what was said was based on the education of everybody tuning in today on uh, fiduciary duties and the relationships between the parties. So we're going to spend the last uh, 12, 13 minutes on uh, limited liability companies. Limited liability companies are very popular now. And they're managed a little bit differently, but a lot of what I said earlier does apply in certain cases to LLCs, and some of it is specifically rejected by the, um, by the uh, statutes under which we operate. So there's two ways of managing a limited liability company. One is member managed and the other is manager managed. So if you have three members and you have checked the box on the articles of organization for the LLC that you're going to be member managed, then you have to have three people sign everything because each member has their own represent representative vote on the management of everything. Per capita voting is the default rule. Now, if you got 20 members of the LLC, you do not want a member managed LLC. You want a manager managed LLC where one person or a small group of managers uh, manage the LLC. So in those cases, the manager controls to the extent provided in the operating agreement, critically important. So in the LLC, you've got to look to the agreement for the articulated list of actions that can be taken by the manager. So in uh, our typical operating agreements, we have, and uh, by the way, many of them are manager-managed LLCs. So the manager can take a certain degree of steps with respect to managing the LLC. And if it's not specifically articulated in the operating agreement as to what he or she can do, you have to go to the second section that says the members need to approve before the manager signs off on whatever action we're talking about. And it could be signing loan documents. So the manager may be able to take, and if you're a, uh, a, a real estate management company and you manage strip centers in your area, the manager certainly can sign snow plowing contracts. He can sign uh, refuge and, and garbage pickup uh, alarm contracts. That's in the ordinary course of business. He can sign up new strip centers to manage. That's in the ordinary course of business. But if the, the company was now to take a loan for some new equipment, that loan, signing loan documents, might need the approval of the members. And that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that things outside the ordinary course of business require all the members to be involved. And then you have all the members sign something called a member certificate or member, membership authorization, which is akin in the corporate world to like a director's resolution. It's an authorization authorizing the manager to buy the equipment. And then the manager goes, buys the equipment, and signs for the equipment. So now the manager got the appropriate member approval. Remember, in LLCs, you, you, uh, they're taxed. The, the, the flow-through uh, ability of LLCs are taxed like partnerships. So um, 
you could have different classes. Distributions are generally in equal shares, but you look through the agreement if different classes exist, and they can, they can be triggered by various triggering events. So the allocations of the tax attributes could be pro rata unless of the special allocation set forth in the Internal Revenue Code, uh, I think it's 704B. So you can actually own 50-50 of a business with your partners, and yet the early losses of the business uh, could be allocated to one shareholder 90% until the business turns around and it starts making money. So those are called special allocations. They require some very specific, unique drafting, and it does work, and it's really a good thing. It's a big advantage with LLCs and partnerships that corporations do not provide. LLCs operating agreements. So just like the shareholder agreement, get into the discussion with your partners up front. And the operating agreement is the LLC equivalent of a shareholder agreement for uh, corporations. The operating agreements will cover management, control, voting, and units. So similar to a corporation, you can have units of an LLC that vote, and you can have non-voting units. How much money are you going to put in for capitalization? How, did, how will money be distributed? Uh, remember, the distributions of cash are different than the tax allocations. Tax allocations are tax attributes that you will be uh, that will be picked up in a uh, what's called a K1 being uh, passed along to the uh, uh, various members. The operating agreement will uh, discuss the transferability of interests. It'll be a mission and withdrawal of members and dissolution on how to bring uh, to terminate the opera, uh, the LLC. So again, our, our belief is always to get it in up front, have the difficult conversation up front, and it is a, a really positive thing to be able to have this uh, up front. So when two uh, sophisticated business people are negotiating these agreements, you will not, um, it does two things. It, it, it gets the hard discussions done up front, and then secondly, it, it forms the basis of being able to go back to a document and saying, how did we discuss this 10 years ago? Uh, and, and two level-headed business people, uh, if they're the two shareholders, can do whatever they want to do as the business goes on. But just remember, it, it, is, it is an important part of the process of, uh, of getting this stuff done up front. Unlike the Illinois Business Corporation Act that has a few fiduciary duties that cannot be uh, changed by way of agreement, the LLC statutes usually have several mandatory provisions that cannot be overwritten by agreement. You can't unreasonably restrict information. You cannot, um, uh, you cannot uh, uh, vary rights to expel a member. Near the bottom there is you can't eliminate or reduce managers or members' fiduciary duties. Now, that's really quite critical because we saw that before on the corporation side too. And last one, uh, you cannot eliminate or reduce the good faith and fair dealing standards. Again, similar to corporations, you can't just contract away your duty to do the right thing with respect to your fellow members and certainly minority uh, members. <clears throat> So the LLCs have fiduciary duties and a duty of loyalty. Members and the managers must act uh, fairly when dealing with the company. The yeah, operating agreement provide a, a procedure for ratifying a transaction with an interested member or manager. So remember, your duty of loyalty, similar to the company, is to the, I'm sorry, similar to a corporation, is to the business first. However, if you want to take a position or a corporate opportunity, a LLC opportunity that's outside of the running through the LLC, you can do it, but you need to get a vote, a full disclosure and approval from your other uh, uh, members and or the manager, depending on what the LL, uh, 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 LLC agreement says. Now, heads up on this one. This is kind of important. So LLCs are often used for joint ventures. Uh, we use them all the time in the real estate world, and there's a reason for that. But what happens is if uh, two uh, business people are going to uh, develop a parcel of property or own real estate, that doesn't mean that one of those real estate developers can't engage in another real estate development to the exclusion of his partner. It's very rare that that restriction would be put into an LLC agreement. 
they are usually a joint venture where each member of the LLC continues to do what they do best in the outside for their living. In fact, when it comes to real estate developments, be careful how much uh, latitude you give each of the members in the group. Because if you are spending millions of dollars and signing personal guarantees to build a shopping center or a strip center in your community, you would not like your partner to then, on his or her own, to open a strip center across the street and compete with you for tenants. So it could be a very, very negative thing if you open the door too much. But uh, generally speaking, I'm giving a heads up that in LLCs and in real estate particularly, um, there is not a duty not to compete. There is competition uh, with members of the LLCs. Um, generally, you could write the competition out of the, uh, com the anti-competitive provisions out of the agreement, but if it's silent, Generally, you cannot compete with the LLC, and it's set forth right in the statutes. If you want to compete, then you have to disassociate, and you have to get out of the LLC on your own. So LLCs own uh, uh, duties to members, too. Um, they uh, are responsible for their duties to members, very similar to the corporation. They're articulating cases by and uh, between the majority interest holder and minority interest holder. The statute doesn't create the fiduciary duties among members, but there are fiduciary duties articulated in cases. And remember, there is at least, right in the Illinois statute, that members must act in good faith and fair dealing uh, with each other. What's the LLC? What's the remedy if uh, you mess up or if you have a member that's messing up? You get them out of the LLC or you can disassociate or an LLC can uh, repurchase the interest of the, uh, of the uh, disassoci disassociating uh, member or dissolve the LLC. So this is um, our close, and I really appreciate everybody kind of tuning into this. If there's any, um, any other questions that you have with respect to uh, things we talked about today, uh, you certainly can send me an email at klavelle, at com, and our uh, email address is on the bottom bar, banner of the uh, all of the... Um, uh, the slides uh, here and uh, just always kind of consider using us as a uh, resource for any questions that you have that you'd like to talk about. Uh, we're an email away and we love doing this and we love talking about these issues. We have a certain group of attorneys that are really uh, dedicated to uh, planning and then we have a group of attorneys that are dedicated to unfortunately fighting these uh, issues in court uh, litigation attorneys so in either case please uh, use us as a resource again thank you so much and uh, we're signing off thank you